Thanks, Chet. Um, thank you all. Is everybody back? I, I guess everybody is uh, back from their little uh, sojourn. Um, thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I think I definitely win the award for having travelled the furthest distance here. Um, so I've come a long way from Adelaide in South Australia. About, uh, about 20 hours in a jet, so it's all good fun. So it gave me time to uh, have a look at a few things. And thanks to Blaze for that presentation. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> but of course I'll have lots to say. So um, my job here is, I guess, to put together an alternate view to that presentation, but I did enjoy it, so thank you. Um, perhaps I can just give you a very brief pricey of what I do. Um, I get paid quite a lot of money by ASICs, God bless their souls. Um, so I've got to put that on the, on the table here right now. <laughs> However, I do have another job, and that is a, as a researcher, and I have uh, visiting fellowships at both um, the U University of Melbourne in Victoria, in, in, uh, in Australia, and also Staffordshire University, which is in the lovely town of Stoke, which is famous for pottery, um, in the UK. Um, I also have a, a quite a significant clinical background. Actually, I, my, my first degree was in zoology. My second degree was in podiatry and my higher degree was in biomechanics. So I can talk to you about cursorial animals and primates and I can talk to you about biomechanics and I can talk to you about feet. So hopefully I'm reasonably well rounded. Um, but uh, basically my, my, before I did this job for ASICS I had about, uh, well unfortunately about 23 years in clinical practice which kind of dates me a bit, gives you some idea of how old I am. But, um, and uh, I had an athlete only care practice, so like Blaze, I only saw athletes, um, and I had a very large involvement in sports medicine. I was Deputy Director of Podiatry Services to the Australian Olympic team uh, for Sydney, and I also was on the teams for Athens, and also, rather bizarrely, for uh, Torino for the Winter Games, and I'm also going to London next year, which will be very exciting. So that's a bit of a background of what I've done. Um, now I find myself working more in pretty hardcore biomechanics and really enjoying my research role. Um, it's a fantastic thing to be involved with. Um, in terms of, of where I see um, ASICs fitting in, and I'm actually not going to talk about ASICs too much because that's not my role here, I'm going to talk about footwear. But I guess um, I would like to talk about them because I'm actually very proud to, to work with them. I think it's a fantastic company to be um, working for. Um, we have a, an incredible basis in research, um, contrary to what you've just heard. Um, and to give you some idea, apart from my involvement with Melbourne and Staffordshire, we also have collaborations with the University of South Australia, with the University of Sydney, with the Australian Institute of Sport, with the University of Wollongong and with some random place called Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, I'm not too sure about them, smaller university I think. Um, however, we do have truly a global collaboration, so we are a company that is very involved in, uh, and very interested in getting the answers, that's really where we want to be. So that might sound a little cliche and a little, a little glib, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so as a result of that, I guess, as I said, a research-based company. Um, we're also very interested in uh, environmental issues and we are actually the greenest athletic footwear company on the planet. We don't use PVC or glue anymore in any of our products and the reason that we have a collaboration with, it, with MIT is because we were very interested in um, trying to figure out what our global footprint was in making shoes. And I can tell you right now that uh, as of uh, this year, the counter 18, we actually have an exact mapping of every component that goes into that shoe, and that shoe is the first shoe ever with a carbon neutral footprint. So we are kind of proud of that and kind of interested in it. So I guess if we're doing all that, we have um, a bank of knowledge, and with these three things, I think we've got a, um, a, a real passion for what we do, and I'm certainly very passionate about not only what I do, but also the brand. And I guess that from that perspective, it leads us to a point where this company, I think, we can say that often what we do, um, we are, we're actually not the, all that interested in minimalist footwear, to tell you the truth, and we are not actually going down that path at all. So some people may criticise us for that, but I'd say to you that we're not first to market, but we are best to market. 
So when we set our mind to it, we actually produce some fantastic product. Now, I guess we can look at the elite athlete and uh, you know, we can look at guys like Ryan here and we can um, take note of what they do. But from my perspective, um, I, I, was, I was hearing with interest some of Blazer's numbers there, percentage numbers. You know, I think that we're far more interested in these guys. Um, the guy who wants to go and eat Subway and have a beer a bit later on and still want to run is still pretty important. Probably describes me, really. Um, and also um, Gia here, who just wants to run for fun and be supported by her friends. These are very important people, very important runners, and very important to all of you. So I think that's probably um, as much a focus for us as it would be to build a shoe for Ryan Hall. So, let's get down to Tintax, shall we? And see what we got here. So we've got a few statements here, and um, these have actually just been repeated by Blaze, but I got these off the website. So this is what he said <laughs> on the 14th of September. And he said that the promotion and prescription of technology shoes is currently done by ignorance, by health professionals. Well, I'm a health professional, and I don't think I'm ignorant. And I think I've had some reasonable, um, reasonably informed choices about the, uh, the way I've prescribed over the years. I think the second statement for you guys, well, um, I'm not sure how much notice you take of shoe retailers. I spend a bit of time speaking to retailers and my observation is that you guys are very analytical and that you can actually see through the, uh, the marketing stuff pretty quickly and you make your own decisions based on what you know. And my observation of retail in North America is that you guys really are experts. You really are experts in your field and you have great knowledge. So I, I guess I don't agree with you on that one, <laughs> Blaze. I think that you know, shoe companies by financial interests, well, everyone's got an agenda. I've got an agenda. I mean, I'm the great Satan because I'm a podiatrist and I work for a shoe company, which is a horrible combination. Um, but everybody has an agenda. So everybody's selling something. Um, and of course, a shoe company has to make a profit. But really, is that all we do? Well, if that's all we do, I've wasted the last 10 years of my life, basically. And I don't think I have done that. So I want to get down to Tintax now, and I do want to challenge some of the things that Blaze has said. So he said the technologies presented annually by running shoe companies have no solid scientific evidence. Well, I'm now going to call into play here a machine that uh, I've invented. It's called the, the bullshit I'm with it. Um, <laughs> and this is it. And I apply this to lots of things. I apply this to myself quite often, okay? But I was very famously called by a, a um, underground uh, running shoe magazine called Sneaker Freaker. I was very famously called the Bullshit Detector and I'm actually quite proud of that. So hopefully that's true. So I'm going to apply the, uh, the Bullshitometer to uh, a few of these statements and just try to figure out where, where it all sits here. So this first statement, well, I'm sorry to say, I think this is false um, and I can hopefully back this up. So the technologies presented, um, no solid scientific evidence. Hmm, okay. Well, let's have a look at some of that we've been doing. Guidance line, clutching kill, heel counter, and gender technologies. Well, these are just a few that actually have very solid evidence in terms of technology that's put into a running shoe that really does work and has a scientific background. But you don't want to believe me or a, or a running shoe company because, uh, you know, why would you do that? But have a look at this. So this is a very interesting study and this is very recent. So this is from the University of Melbourne and this is uh, 
A couple of researchers, Kim Burnell, Professor Kim Burnell, who is uh, the chair of the uh, Centre for Health, Exercise and Sports Medicine at the University of Melbourne, and Rana Hinman, along with another fellow called Tim, um, uh, Tim Wrigley. And they've found that they are able to build a shoe. They've actually given it a name because they had a lot of funding from ASICS. It's called the ASICS Jewel Melbourne. And it's a shoe that's built specifically for active people who have diagnosed osteoarthritis of the medial compartment of their knee. Now, to cut a long story short, um, they've specially designed the shoe with features including variable density midsole. Now, to give you some idea, this study has been endowed by the Australian Research Council linkage grant to the tune of a million dollars. The Australian government is not in the habit of giving researchers money unless they think this is pretty fair income or, or pretty realistic research. It's been matched in kind by ASICS for a million dollars. That's a very large sum of money for anybody to put into a search fund. Two million dollars is the total. This study's now been going for about five years and the number of um, subjects in the study are now exceed 1,400, okay? It's a very, very well designed, very um, evidence-based study. So they've certainly established and have built a shoe that actually has some very solid scientific evidence uh, to suggest that you can change the way um, a shoe uh, influences injury. What about this one? Um, oh, hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Oh, yeah, okay. So that was that. And actually, I have got a, a couple of gifts here for you, boys, because I've got... <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just had to do this. So where's my little pads over here? So I know that you, you love references and things, but here's a couple of papers for you to read. And I'm co-author on all of these, and these are all recent, and one of them won lots of awards. Um, <coughs> Got editorial comment as being one of the most important papers in gender research ever. So and I, I can comment after that. You can do whatever you like with them, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect I know what you do with them, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, just it's the illustration here is that there is good quality science that goes into product, okay, and that does actually influence injury. So let's have a look at our next one. Shock absorbing shoes do not lower stress um, put on the skeleton. I talk here about knees, hip and back. Okay, well I think this statement's false as well. Now, you've heard Blaze talk a little bit about uh, impact peaks, and it's very interesting um, and very deceptive. So what you're seeing here is the classic um, vertical ground reaction force. Now, I don't want to bore you with this, but we're gonna point it here. Okay, what you normally see um, with vertical ground reaction force is two peaks. The first one is called FZ1, and it's called the, um, the passive peak, and the second one is the active peak. So you can see the, the higher one here, right up there, and this is very distinctive of what happens when you strike the ground, okay? Now the theory goes, as you saw from Dan Lieberman's work, that if you're a four-foot striker, you've got a nice smooth curve and you don't get that sudden impact, okay? What this is showing you is quite an interesting little study from Ross Clark, it's very, very recent. It's showing you four different shoulder conditions, um, a men's gel nimbus, a women's gel nimbus, a Vibram and a gel light 33. Now what you can see is the red demonstrates the Vibram shoe. And what you can see is that there's not, not one, not two, but three impact peaks. Okay, so the concept that by wearing a minimalist shoe is going to automatically change your gait and put you on your forefoot and reduce impact loading is, according to this study, not correct.
and I'll show you a little bit more about that later on. But this is a very, very recent study. What else have we got here? Um, so this theory that shock absorbing shoes don't lower stress but on the skeleton. Well, what they do do, I think, I think um, what we need to put on board here is that impact is actually not that important. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people are stressing the importance of impact. It's actually not that important. It's one of the least important input signals. And certainly when you look at these graphs where you've got peaks and troughs and valleys, this first impact peak is always said to be the most important one because it talks about hill strike. Actually, that's not correct at all. It doesn't work that way. This is very muddy. It depends how you filter the information. It depends whether you summate the two peaks. And there are a lot of biomechanical variables on that. It's actually not that important. But if we have a look at this next one, what shoes do do is they do order accelerations. They absolutely reduce pressure. And Blaze quite rightly said that that only affects the foot because you can't really measure pressure elsewhere. But it makes a huge difference to pressure in the foot. It also alters dangerous frequencies. It, of course, as Blaze pointed out, it protects from the environment, which is actually kind of important. You need to talk about torques, okay? It reduces torques and joint moments, and it definitely influences uh, injury patterns, but how do you measure it? Okay, one of the challenges I've put to people is said, okay, if we want to research barefoot runners, and we want to do it in a university, and we say, let's take this study to a university, and we're going to have these people for six weeks. We're going to make them run for 45 minutes, three times a week, for six weeks. That would not get through the ethics committee of any university anywhere in the world. Why would it not get through? Why wouldn't it get through? What's the purpose of an ethics committee? to make sure no one hurts themselves. It would not get through on that ground alone. Would not get through. So it's very hard to do the studies that are required to actually make this link between injury and footwear. And we can talk about that more in, in the question session. session. Absorption antipronation system shoes do not lower injury and do not improve comfort. Okay, sorry, I think this is false too. Have a look at this one. This is from Michael Kinchington. This is, again, uh, this year, um, only a month ago. Has been released. A footwear program consisting of athlete education, prescription of footwear, and frequent rotation of footwear resulted in a lower incidence of injury and higher comfort ratings. 
So it affects both injury and comfort, both of which we said doesn't happen. One of the critical things here is if you look at it, I don't know how many of you are into stats, I hate stats, but I have to learn about them. These are extremely significant levels, okay? This is a major change in those two parameters. So we saw a big difference, a big difference. What else have we got here? Have a look at this one. Now, Blaze actually quoted this, and I'm not sure. Maybe, I know, I'm not jet lag, but I read this paper inside out, and, and I actually took it quite directly from it. He looked at the effects of motion control footwear and running, and he did a systematic review. Now, a systematic review is the second most rigorous scientific study you can do. The only one that's better is called a randomized controlled trial. And what the systematic review did in this case is it looked at 14 randomized controlled trials, and it collated the data. What did they find? They found the results revealed that motion control footwear was effective in reducing the amount of foot predation and the peak vertical impact during running. That's directly from the paper. That's what they found, okay? So that's a pretty significant finding in relation to this quote up the top. If we take the shoe of people who have run in modern big shoes, 80% will change their biomechanics and run this way after only a few steps. Mm. I don't agree. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't agree with that. Why not? Let's have a look. So this is the oft-quoted um, graph, and this is, as Blaise Blaise just showed you some of Daniel Lieberman's work. I was in London only a week ago having a debate with Daniel Lieberman, um, which unfortunately was heavily censored, unlike this one. 
And this is what he always shows. So he shows barefoot, and you can see here that we've got the impact peak and the second impact peak. And then when you go on a shoe, where well, you get slight lessening of the impact peak, but it's still there. And then when you go barefoot, you get this beautiful smooth curve, okay? Well, this is absolute ballooning. That's not what happens in the lab at all. Okay, if you don't filter the data, maybe you can do that, but this is not what happens. Now, if Daniel Liebenwood was here, I would say the same thing. I have major issues with this study, which is now being put on some sort of pedestal. He got fantastic press from this. Um, it's now been quoted by everybody who, I guess, wants to cherry pick the information, but there are some major issues with this. Let's have a look at them. The first is that he looked at two groups. He looked at habitually, actually looked at five groups, but two that he picked on, uh, he looked at habitually short barefoot adults, uh, sorry, habitually barefoot adults and habitually short adults. What he actually did, is that the group who were um, habitually barefoot were 40 on average. The group who were habitually short were 19 on average. Now, there's a huge difference between a 19 year old and a 40 year old. I know it because I'm over 40. So I'm telling you that in any major research um, uh, paper, that alone would be enough to raise some suspicion. But he did some other things. He randomized his statistics when he promised he wouldn't. In the world of science, randomizing your statistics is uh, not allowed. Completely forbidden. What else did he do? Well, he actually, this was actually a pilot study, but he presented it as fact, an innate fact. What else did he do? Well, he mixed his gender. Now, I'm not sure whether you know this, but women are different to men, okay? They have different biomechanics. They have a different gene pool. They have different everything, different weight. They, have, they run completely differently. So he should not have done that either. What else did he do? He also said that he used 3D kinematics when he only used 2D. Very naughty, Mr. Lieberman, or Professor Lieberman. So I think in the world of real science, this study has been extensively discredited. There's a reason why it was in Nature magazine, which is like the science equivalent of Reader's Digest, because it's non-peer reviewed. It wouldn't have gone into another journal, not ever. Okay? I'm not the only one who thinks that. So I think that to actually take this as given fact is wrong. We should not be doing that. and actually be looking at impact peaks at all is not what you want to be looking at. You want to be looking at the real um, indicators of impact, which are accelerations and joint moments. Okay? Don't look at that at all. You don't believe me? Okay, 80% will change their biomechanics and run this way after only a few steps. Hmm, okay. Here's some more work from Clark. You can see what's happening here that we've got a men's, uh, a men's nimbus, a women's nimbus. In red, we've got the Vibram and we've got a Joel White 33. Again, you're seeing an incredibly steep um, impact transient here. You're seeing uh, first impact transient, sorry, vertical loading rate, impact transient, one, two, three impact transients. Okay. So in this case, on the basis of what's being said about impact, the Vibram is by far the worst shoot. By far the worst shoot. I can show you something else here too. This is kind of interesting. So if we have a look at... This is four trials of just looking at the Vibram. Again, one, two, three peaks, but look how spread out they are. There's no consistency in this at all. If we have a look at this same athlete in a shoot, you can see that the consistency is much greater. Okay, so we don't have this third transient down here. We've got much greater consistency. So on the basis of looking at impact, we'd have to say that was a better shoot. It's, of course it's not, it's different. It's different, but on the basis of the argument, it's better. Alrighty, so we've got three statements here that I want to take in tandem. Traditional shoes change natural biomechanics. It changes the muscle contraction sequences. The 
the modern shoe increases the vertical loading rate which is associated with stress fractures. Hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like a definition of what natural biomechanics are because biomechanics covers everything from the way your blood throws, flows through your veins to the way you uptake oxygen. Okay? There is no such thing as natural biomechanics. Everybody has different biomechanics. There is no one perfect model for biomechanics. It's like saying form, which is like the holy grail. Can anybody here describe me what perfect form is? There's an appreciation for what is good running, but there's no such thing as perfect form. It does not exist. Okay? Perfect biomechanics don't exist. Natural biomechanics don't exist. Everyone's different. Everyone's an experiment with sample number of one. Everyone. It changes the muscle contraction sequence. This is where I have to agree with blades. It absolutely does. So does barefoot and minimalist. Okay, just changes it in a different way. Of course it changes it. Is it better or worse? That's very argumentative. The modern shoe increases the vertical loading rate, which is associated with stress fractures. This is categorically not true. Okay, now I know that Blaze is doing a uh, systematic review here, but I've had a look at a lot of the literature, and he and I are probably very good at going head to head on quoting literature, but as far as I know, there's only one study that actually has looked at this, and it looked at tibial stress fractures. 1% of the overall stress fracture market. Okay, it didn't look at the most common fractures. The ones that we tend to see with things like five round five fingers, which are metatarsal stress fractures. It didn't look at those. Again, if we have a look at this, this is um, Ross Clark's work out of 2001. I want to um, really sort of have a around this time. This is a different version. This is a guy who was a uh, habitually midfoot striker. And an athlete who um, habitually wore a very low profile uh, racing flat. Have a look at what happens when he goes from black, which is the shoe he traditionally wears, to a midfoot strike in the vibram, to a forefoot strike in the vibram. This is a huge vertical loading rate. Okay, now I've said this isn't very important, but if we believe it is important, you would not want to be seeing that. Okay? So a very large impact transient compared to the other two states. So on the basis of this, if you go from a midfoot strike in a racing flat to a midfoot strike in a vibram five fingers, you potentially are in big trouble. We also know that big shoes weaken foot tissues. Well, I've got to say, this is one of the things that absolutely drives me insane. Really insane. <laughs> There's much discussion on this, and the discussion is that it's fact that barefoot strengthens and the traditional athletic footwear weakens the foot. Well, the answer to this is, it probably does strengthen your foot, and of course it doesn't weaken your foot. How many people here, just a show of hands, how many people here believe that putting on what Blaze calls a big bulky shoe is like putting a cast on your foot? And we need commitment. Who believes that? One person believes that. Two. No, it depends. Two. Depends on kind of an athlete you are, where you're coming from. No, it's a simple question because that's what's been said. It's been it's been stated that if you put a big bulky shoe on, it's the equivalent of putting a cast on your foot or or a big brace on your foot. You're so glad. <laughs> All right. Well, let's explore it. So we've got two people in this room who think that's true. So 
This is what I can get out of the uh, off the net. Running in shoes makes our feet weak, causes us to overpronate, and gives us knee problems. Until Nike, people had strong feet and much lower incidence of knee injuries. Chris McDougall. If this were the case, you've got to think about this. Okay, if we take this statement at face value, it means that if we took the first 5,000 finishers of the New York City Marathon and we took their shoes off, what would we expect to see? They'd all have flat feet, correct? Isn't that what he's saying? They'd all have flat feet. If it weakens your foot and it makes you overpronate, everybody who wears a big bulky shoe is going to overpronate. That's what he's saying. Hmm. Well, I don't think that's the case. I've seen a lot of feet in my day. Now, to illustrate this even further, if you want to have a look at a foot that truly is weak, a foot that has atrophy or wasting of the intrinsic muscles of the foot, you need look no further than an advanced diabetic foot or a disease called Charcot Marie Tooth. Okay? Now, in these people, the disease actually destroys the muscles in the foot. It's called the intrinsic minus foot. You know what happens to these people? In 100% of cases, they develop a high arched foot. 100% of cases, okay? So this is simply not true. Now I have another illustration. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody want to describe them what a cycling shoe is like? It's extremely rigid, right? It's extremely inflexible. Does that mean that every elite cyclist in the world has flat feet? Hmm, I don't think so. Anybody know what that is? It's a ski boot. Does this mean that every elite skier in the world has flat feet, flat pronated feet, because their feet, their muscles have wasted? Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. So I think that uh, this this is a myth that we should be busting right now, um, and it's making all sorts of assumptions. That, that one of the assumptions is that you're inherently weak to start with. Do you believe that me walking around now wearing a big pair of cowboy boots and not getting a workout? Yeah, my feet are still working. They're working fine. All right, next. Many subjects on this, so you then go to the next part of the equation. So, well, wearing big bulky shoes makes your feet weak, and then you get a bunion. Whoa. Okay. Sorry, I don't agree with that. Here's the uh, here's the literature. Um, you can have a look at the extrinsic and intrinsic factors. This is a very recent study, 2011, from Pereira and co-workers. It says the only extrinsic factors are high-heeled, narrow shoes, and excessive weight bearing. You can see the intrinsic factors are multi multifactorial. All right, and there is a statement here, not a single study anywhere in the scientific literature has ever implicated athletic footwear in a bunion or in hallux valgus. Not one, not ever, at any time, never. Okay, so I think we should be very careful saying cause and effect here in the other direction it doesn't exist.
recommend minimalist at the beginner and the overweight. Mm. Okay, well, maybe maybe blaze the ride, maybe not, I'm not sure. But I'd say bloody hell, that's pretty hardcore <laughs> if it were me. Uh, and he, he might be right, mate. maybe that's the way to go, but it does seem pretty hardcore to me. Um, and I think one of the issues I have here is that I've hunted around and I've searched the web and I've asked people and I still do not have a definition of minimalist. Has anybody here nailed it? Okay, I've come up with this one. Truly minimalist shoes are intended to help you develop your form by allowing your feet and legs to work the way they were intended. Bollocks is what I say. I don't agree with that at all because this is talking about an experiment of one. Yeah, that might be true for one person, but how many have we got in this room? 40 people? Every person in this room is different. Every person is a different weight. We've got different sectors. We've got different biomechanics. We've got different running styles. Okay, we've got different attitudes. Everybody's different. You cannot apply one rule to everybody. The other issue with minimalist, I think, well, you know, here we've got the Vibram Five Fingers and, and good luck to them. They've, um, they've got their niche and they've done well. But the way I read it, everybody who's buying a Vibram Five Fingers is out there running marathons, okay? That's simply not true. If every Vibram Five Fingers shoe sold, 6% are being used to run it, okay? The rest of them are being used for what they were designed for. And that's this, okay? I know what you're thinking. You should take your shoes off, but it was designed as a yachting shoe, okay? It was designed to go boating and to go kayaking in, and it morphed into a rock climbing shoe, and now somehow it's a marathon running shoe. Where the hell did that come from? I mean, really, I don't get it. Anyway, the myths within the myths. The myth that running, shoe, running barefoot or minimalist reduces injury. Well, can we please be sensible about this, okay? Some runners are going to get less injured if they run barefoot or they wear a minimalist shoe. Of course they are. I accept that and I think that's great. But equally, some runners are going to get, they're going to get more injuries doing the same thing. So this is about trying to understand where this all fits together and who it's going to benefit and who it won't benefit. I was really pleased to see Blaze say, look, you don't fiddle with somebody who's not injured. Okay, why would you do that? If someone's working well in a shoe, why would you want to change that? So I think we just need to take that on board. We've got to really be careful of this um, concept of correlation versus causation. By that I mean, if, if I was to say to you, where do you live? Calgary. Whereabouts? Calgary. Calgary, okay. What's the weather been like here? It's been pretty grubby. Lots of snow. Lots of snow, okay. <coughs> so what, what day did you leave Calgary? Yesterday. Was it snowing? Say yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> there was snow. What did you have for breakfast? Bowl of cereal. Right. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Say toast. 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 <laughs> didn't snow here today. So therefore, the fact that you had toast and it didn't snow. Okay. That's correlation. It's not cause. Okay. Now I can manipulate. I can manipulate the facts whatever way I like, and I can say, Oh my God, you had toast, and it's changed the weather. That's unbelievable. I can make. I'm seriously. I can promise you, I can make a compelling case for that. I really could. And that's unfortunately what's happening here to a large degree. You can go to, the, I can go to the scientific literature and I can cherry pick little parts of that and I can make it fit my story very easily, okay? What we've got to do is we've got to be fair and logical and we've got to think about the most important person who's the athlete and try to figure out what works for them.
Are you a heel striker that causes the shoe? No, it's not the shoe, damn it. It's just not. Who's this? This is a lot. This is along with the mule side effect. One of my personal heroes. This is this is of course the great Abibi Bakila. Now you know his story. Okay, 1960, ran the Olympic marathon, running barefoot, and he won the gold medal. Hell's teeth. That's a hell of an effort. Okay, won the gold medal. Okay, and he won the gold medal because he was barefoot. Right? He didn't win the gold medal because he was barefoot. He ran. Well, he won the gold medal because they couldn't find a pair of shoes to fit him because he was a late inclusion in the team. Okay? He came back in 1964, you know what happened, don't you? He ran it again. He won the gold medal again. And he broke the world record. He broke the world record because he's wearing shoes. No, he didn't. He broke the world record because he's a great athlete. It's got nothing to do with the shoes. Okay. So, again, cause versus correlation. I can make a strong case and say, damn, it was the shoes. But it wasn't. It was him. Now, this is a BB Bikila showing particularly bad form, especially bad form. And a BB Bikila was a well noted heel striker. Here he is, heel striking, running barefoot. You can absolutely be a heel striker barefoot, and you can absolutely be a four foot striker wearing a shoe. Absolutely. No problem whatsoever. Okay, it's how you train yourself. I'm very concerned about this argument that people are saying by wearing a shoe or by not wearing a shoe you're going to become a better athlete okay that's not true you become a better athlete through really hard work through developing your core strength through developing your glutes by looking at what's going on at your hip okay these are the really important things looking at gait is very important okay form is a ubiquitous fleeting thing it's about how hard you work to become a better athlete Okay, um, and I think um, Blaze has shown some slides of Meb, um, very famous heel striker, but he can still win the New York City Marathon. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, I'm, it's got nothing to do with the shoe, it's got to do with the athlete. So, Simon Schubag, I've got no idea why I put Simon Schubag up here. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, so this is my personal philosophy, okay, and I, and I think this is maybe where Blaze and I might have some, some point of agreement. My personal uh, philosophy here is that if you have variation in your foot strike and you have variation in the terrain you run on, and you have variation in the way you train, then you're probably going to have a bit of a head start in terms of heading off injury. Now by this I mean I think it's extremely important to get off the road and do some training on trail. Very important. And the reasons are blindingly obvious. It's because if you run on the road, you're imparting the same load in the, at the same rate, step after step after step. There is a reason that Tarahumara apparently don't get injured apart from the fact they're a genetically isolated tribe that weigh five, 50, 50 pounds and um, five foot two, okay? And they've done it all of their lives, amongst other reasons. One of the reasons might be is because they run the Copper Canyons, okay? They're all over the shop, uphill, down dale, across tracks. They're distributing the load. It's very, very important. So mixing up your training is very important. I agree with Blaze. If you want to be faster, you have to reduce the braking force. And the way you do that is to get your centre of mass of your foot better, okay? One of the ways you can do that is to move further forward on your foot, okay? But you have to be careful. You have to be very careful, okay? And if we think impacts are really important, why, and I think cadence is also very important, but if we think impacts are important, which remember I don't think are important, what happens when you run a marathon with a high cadence? You take about another seven and a half thousand steps. So if impact's important, it's another 7,500 7, cumulative impacts. Would that be bad for you? Darn right. But it's not, because impacts don't matter. Okay? Torques, moments, accelerations matter. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Actually, how much, how long am I supposed to go for? <laughs> how long have we been going for? I feel like I've been up here forever. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll wrap it up in a minute. Technologies presented annually by running shoe companies have no solid scientific evidence. This is where we went back to um, right at the start. So I'm going to finish up here. Well, I'm going to give you something here. This is a real gift, okay? I hope it's a real gift. So I can tell you honestly that you're the first group in the world to ever heard this. Um, Eva's not heard this. So this is a brand new 
brand new um, uh, a project that I've been working on. Um, it's to try to give you an understanding of what goes into actually trying to build a shoe that we think is going to help the athlete perform better. Okay. This is a real living, living breathing shoe that's going to happen. Okay.